It is the year 2472, and the Earth has suffered a great calamity. Hundreds of years of popular culture have vanished. Without the sacred films and texts for guidance, civilization is devoid of anything cool. Then, three incubation chambers are unearthed, and from within, men from the time of the great blockbusters emerge. Now, through highly interesting conversations, they share invaluable insight about what once was. The movies, the shows, the comics, toys, and books. This is The Hyperspace Podcasting in the 25th Century. Welcome in, podcast pioneers, to the Hyperspace Podcasting in the 25th Century. The interwebs first. And yes, still only podcast that we know about. My name is Jared. My name is Matt. And my name is Mike. All right, guys, on today's show, we're going to talk about collections. Like debt collection? Yes. Yes, I'm going to start a podcast about how... The Columbia Music Company came after me <laughs> when I was a senior in high school for for uh, abusing their one cent policy. Do you remember that back in the twentieth century? Yes. I didn't do it, but I had a friend who was who was just just a gangster with that. <laughs> oh, man, you would like tape a penny to this mailer, and you would get you know twelve. CDs or cassettes for a penny, but you were locked into buying an album at full price, which for a CD was about $75 <laughs> for basically the rest of your natural life once a year. Yeah, that was... Uh, they also got... had it that if you signed up a friend, you would get extra CDs. Yes. And I did that right. where I signed up a friend and I gave him like a couple CDs for letting that's what his... That's what my friend was doing. He was he just hustled everybody. <laughs> Man, that, gosh, that thing, I got that, the Columbia, I guess it was the Columbia Music Club. and There was an RCA uh, too. BMG, BMG. BMG, yeah. I remember, yeah, BMG. I did both of them and uh, I think got letters from both of them eventually. You remember how... There were certain CDs, not C, well, cassettes. It wasn't a problem with CDs, but with cassettes, like some looked like the ones you bought in the store, and some was just a picture of the album, like in the middle of the cover. Do you remember that? <laughs> you know, I don't remember that, but I remember our mutual friend, Mike Larry, used to be upset that in his OCD ness, the, the cassettes he got from those clubs sometimes didn't didn't like look like the rest of his cassettes yeah because they 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 i think what it was they manufactured them themselves i guess they had like a deal yeah but instead of like doing the correct cover they just took a picture of the album put it on the yeah it's, the it's sometimes how you would get you know a, a different looking cover from like the sci-fi book club or something they'd have their oh no their, i don't i didn't know that <laughs> their own particular uh, book art and all well, they also had oh, man. the books from those clubs are also like different sizes than all the other books. Yes. Which, which is why I never joined any of those. Cause that would oh. have made me insane. I, I joined the sci-fi <laughs> book club just for the exclusive uh, star Wars hardcovers. My, my friend doing the Columbia music stuff, he never used his own name, but he had, he had <laughs> like him and like three of the houses to his like left. He had an agreement with, so he would use their address, but he all used fake names. So for like four homes in a row, all these, you know, fake names were getting the, the Columbia music deal. So he had like, what was the sudden, advantage he, to having the fake name? It just, they couldn't say it's him. It's like, well, who the hell is, you know, Gregor P, you know, urine or whoever his <laughs> name is. Yes. But yes, it was school. Gregor P. Does urine. IP <laughs> daily live here. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's how it was. It's like he'd have a he'd have like a whole box of CDs. He'd walk, he'd be like, Hey It's Phil McCrevis here. Man, look, just what we're talking about probably sounds like Martian to any kid yeah, living they today. No What's They're a like, CD? Wait, what? You had to do what for music? Oh, you mean you just didn't go to YouTube and listen to it? <laughs> it came in the mail. It was work, folks. And then Man. Then uh, the, for the dedicated fans, you had to track down the singles. 
And those the bands yes. I listened to, they were usually overseas singles. And singles, uh, man. Like yes, the, the CD singles. The heavy metal magazines had like the little the page where that you would see like running free single. That's awesome. I don't have that. And then you'd <laughs> order it and again, once again, all that stuff on the internet. I will still go down rabbit holes sometimes because you know like mike was saying um the beastie boys did they have countless eps and cd singles out there that i don't even know i, I don't even know they exist yet but i will find them and occasionally you know go down an ebay rabbit hole looking for some and then i'll have to stop and say i, I no i can't i, I gotta i'm not I gonna did, pay i did that 30. all real time when it was actually coming out man i mean well, after all jared who in their right mind has the, the time to spend collecting stuff like that or anything and build up a huge collection? Who has the time? Oh, uh, well, I think we're going to be talking to someone like that this evening. Oh, yes. And you will meet him very soon. Because tonight, we are going to be talking to my friend Brian in our Transmissions Hyperspace interview about... His Star Wars collection. And guys, for those of you who don't usually listen to the show on YouTube, there is going to be a visual element to it this week, not just our super shiny animation that we usually do. We are going to be putting pictures of Brian's collection up um, as we talk about it during the interview. So if you're interested in what his collection looks like, Definitely check out our YouTube channel and um, see this amazing collection for yourself. Let me tell you, I got a small preview of that collection. Just a few pictures he sent before we started recording. And my mind is blown just by seeing these few pictures. I can't wait to talk to him tonight. Well, I mean... I can't either. Why, why should we wait? Why don't we just get right into it? Can anybody hear me? We found something. Transmissions. The Hyperspace Interview. Transmission commencing. Today on Transmissions, the Hyperspace Interview, we have a man who for 40 years has been accumulating Star Wars ephemera, toys, vehicles, different kind of merchandise, autographs, etc. Half of his house is a literal Star Wars museum. And tonight we are going to talk to him about how that came to be. He also happens to be a friend of mine for many, many years. Please welcome to the show my pal, Brian. Brian, welcome. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Brian, nice to meet you, man. Unbelievable collection. Oh, well, thanks. I'm glad you all got to see some pictures beforehand. That's uh, That gives you a good frame of reference for you know, what we're going to talk about today and everything. So those listening at home, you have no idea the scale and scope of what this man has accumulated and accomplished. He sent us a handful of pictures and I've been literally staring at them all day. And I feel like I'm looking at pictures of a museum and that just keeps going and going. It, it's absolutely mind blowing. Hopefully by the time you hear this, we will have posted some of those on our social media. Yeah. I'll cherry pick and put a few up. It's just unbelievable to see. So Brian, I guess we'll start at the beginning. Can you remember your first Star Wars toy? Yes, I do remember. I got an action figure. It was a hammerhead from uh, the Star Wars line. I probably got it back in 79 or 80. It was right before the Empire Strikes Back came out is when I started getting some Star Wars toys and things. Hammerhead in the blue yes. unitard. Oh, yes. And, yeah, that was one of my favorites as a kid. And those uh, limbs that look like tree limbs. Yeah, he, he kind of had a Groot thing going on there. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> the first Groot. And he has made uh, he's made somewhat of a resurgence recently in the Clone Wars, the 
blue wearing unitard hammerhead. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so that was your first figure. Did you have a favorite classic Kenner action figure growing up? Probably one of my favorites growing up would have been the um, the Bespin Fatigue Luke. I loved it. It came with a gun and a lightsaber. I mean, what more could you want? Wasn't and, that one of the first ones that came with like an actual lightsaber as opposed to it being in the arm? Yes, it, it was the first one to come with a an actual lightsaber oh, great as opposed trivia. to one that slides out. Yes, so, a, a, and oddly, a yellow lightsaber. Yes, <laughs> it came with a yellow one, and it it's funny because you know later on when they released a a uh, Luke Jedi, it came with a blue lightsaber. Well, that wasn't right either because we all know that he had a green one. So yes, and you they know, switched th- it over to a green one <laughs> yeah. later. And it's funny because I got it for Christmas and I'm at my grandmother's house. And I'm going, what is this <laughs> blue lightsaber? What kind of garbage is this, man? <laughs> it's supposed to be green. And you know, it, it prompted me to write this letter to Kenner <laughs> and I sent what? them, uh, I, I sent them this letter. And I said, sent my Luke letter came with a blue lightsaber and I want a green one. And then here are a bunch of these proofs of purchases. I threw it into the envelope. I said, I also need these weapons that I've lost. <laughs> and I tell smart. you what, they sent me a pack about two or three months later of a crap ton of weapons. Wow. I mean, there must have been 30 or 40 weapons in that pack. Man, if they, I had known, I got my just green took a lightsaber. letter. So yeah. it worked? Yeah, it actually worked. If I had known that, I would have written them immediately. I lost half my weapons and always just chalked it up as, well, that's going to be it. Oh, yes. Oh, man. I'm I'm looking at some of the pictures that Brian sent earlier, and the one that grabs my eye right away is the Tatooine Luke. Oh, with yes. the uh, telescopic lightsaber. That was my very first action figure I ever had for Star Wars. And I remember losing that lightsaber because I had taken it out of its telescoping arm, and I yes. lost it at preschool or kindergarten or one of that. And, and I remember going home so depressed with my lightsaberless Luke. <laughs> his and, uh, empty arm slot. His empty oh, arm. Yes. And you couldn't do anything about it. But it's unbelievable to see what he has accumulated. Now, Brian, I'm looking at some stuff right now. Now, there's unbelievable amount of curios and display cases that he has. But as we'll get into all the 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 different kinds of things that you kind of, you know, sought out and how you kind of put yourself together. But the original figures that you had as a kid, is that, is that what I'm looking at in one case? They're all your original figures or have you just oh. kind of like, Oh like, no, oh, there, no, I have to ask because I don't there know. There is a story here. <laughs> there are perfect. many stories here. Okay. <laughs> I, I will set it up and say, yeah, why yes, don't you, you steer me down this, this windy road of collector so, uh, listen, conundrums. Now and and you know it's this was kind of a shared journey between me and Brian again. Uh, the mid '80s, Star Wars Kenner, it, it started to it was in decline. It, it's they started to be phased out, and you know Star Wars was kind of entering that hibernation phase, the dark times as we call it. Yes. Uh, and GI Joe had pretty much taken over our lives by then. I do recall. Standing on Brian's back porch, destroying Star Wars figures what? with firecrackers <laughs> and a BB gun. Oh yes! Wow. Yes. As a matter of fact, the there are two major destructive moments that just stick out in my mind in relation to Star Wars figures. <laughs> one is that I, I had a a, a snow speeder that I got one year and um, for Christmas. And I set it out on the back porch when I was in destructive mode and put firecrackers in it. And the thing burnt into a flat piece of plastic. <laughs> it was just, just black <laughs> charred plastic. And there must've been one of the, the wingmen that Luke was covering then. Yes. It was one of Luke's win, wingmen. He got hit by an ad at. So, um, and then the other one hurts a little more. But my reasoning at the time was, oh, it's an oddball, it's a defect, so we'll blow it up. And that was a blue snaggletooth. Which, 
now this may sound like a lot, but there were only 50,000 of those made. And compared to some of the other numbers on figures, you know, which are in the hundreds of thousands apiece. So, yeah, that blue snaggletooth got uh, shot many, wow. many so, times. Tell me, ballpark, today, blue snaggletooth in decent condition, what are you looking at? Two, three hundred bucks. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can't blame you. We all did that stuff, but, but who would know? You know, I mean, but, by, by that time, you had to make room for the G.I. Joes. The G.I. Joes oh, were yeah, coming down definitely. the pike. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Star they caused Wars, their own epic battles. <laughs> Yeah, and, you know, Star Wars was yesterday's news at that point. How about we we take a leap forward? Well, before we get started there, do you have original figures left in your collection that you can point to and say, those were mine from when I was a kid? That would be really hard. I don't, I don't know that I could, to be honest. Um, do you and the think reason you have is, some knocking around in your collection? I probably do. Um, and, and I also may have some that aren't in the, you know, the main display case. They may be in a diorama somewhere or something like that. Okay. So then, then let me give you a starting point then. At what point in your life did you start to say, I'm going to be, I'm going to collect this stuff. I'm going to, I'm actually going to make an active effort to start collecting. Because if you were a kid and you weren't, you were destroying stuff, I mean, it was, it, you had fun with it, but it wasn't the world to you. So when did it become the world? Okay, so 25 years ago, in 1995, it was kind of early in the year, and my sister's boyfriend, John, was hanging out over here, and we got to talk, and I don't know if he was waiting on her to get home or something, and we, we hadn't really done much together or anything. We occasionally just passed each other in the hallway at the house and said, hey, or whatever, and that was about it. And we got to talk and, and he, he's like, do you have any old Star Wars toys? And I was like, yeah, I've got some of those. He goes, will you sell them to me? And I was like, and I got to thinking, I'm like, no. <laughs> and he goes, well, why don't you start collecting? Let's go dig them out. And so I dug them out and, you know, I had 60 or 70 figures that I didn't destroy. I was actually pretty particular about destroying figures. I, I tried to, except for that blue style tooth, I tried to keep one of each. So it was really just duplicates and stuff that I was blowing up. And uh, we started going through some stuff. And what's funny is just a few months before I'd gotten rid of some uh, vintage boxes and things that some ships came in uh, and a couple of you know, play sets and things, but which kind of hurt, you know, because later down the road, I had to get those things again. <laughs> but um, rebuy them. Yeah, rebuy. But um, no, it, you know, it touched off something in me and. It's just like, man, we just got to go with this. And and John and I started searching the Southeast for Star Wars toys. That's now, was really this how before, it all began. Was this before eBay? Yeah, this is right before eBay. As a matter of fact, the first carded figure purchase I made was this. It was a Vader on a Return of the Jedi card in like an alternate pose. And I got it at a garage sale for like 15 bucks. And then there, the lady had... A couple of others and i think john bought one and i bought i may have bought two of them at the time but um yeah and that kind of you know that's how it started you know going to garage sales and then we went to a toy show and i was in college i was a broke college student and i somehow spent a thousand dollars on star wars toys <laughs> at this toy show at the jacobs building on the wrong side of town and they used to do a toy show there every year and these people come and vintage star wars toys were pretty hot you know, with those shows. Well, so. you know, that's also when they were handing out credit cards on college campuses like candy. Oh, yes, man. that is true. And I had no restraints <laughs> when it came to buying Star Wars at the time. In 1995, that was also the start of the relaunched Power of the Force uh, figures. Right. Did you jump into that with both feet? Oh, yeah. Yeah both feet i collected you know i've got all those and they weren't actually very good sculpts they had all these guys all jacked up like they were he and they were smaller you know the same scale as the vintage figures but they well, remember the luke up specifically like, had the big oh. pectorials yeah you had the, oh yeah the they were jacked up like he-man or something <laughs> and the big v-net the v-net shorty robe oh yeah, yeah it was just like <laughs> 
Yeah, he was busting out of that thing. And Han, too, he did, like his shirt was all around his biceps and everything. Oh, it's man, like, it what was... What's happening here? It was completely ridiculous, those figures. But, man, I was like, all right, we got some new Star Wars figures. Let's get them all, you know? And it's been kind of chaos ever since in buying. <laughs> I don't I don't have everything that has come out over the last 25 years, but, well, I probably got about 90% of it as far <laughs> as action figures are concerned or, or more. So. That's a, it's amazing. Have you ever had this entire collection appraised? Um, I've done my own appraisal of it. I mean, there's the thing is, you know, my insurance company wanted to, uh, you know, send somebody out here to appraise it, and I was and then do a, like a extra rider on my insurance, and I was like, who are they going to send? Because I mean, I'm as qualified as any of these fools to do mm-hmm. this, so I. I ended up in when I went with a collectible insurance company, uh, collectible insurance company, and they uh, just let me put my own valuation on it. So, and you told them three billion dollars. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was I was actually I, I was I was very fair in that evaluation. I, I didn't inflate it. As a matter of fact, they they kept escalating it every year, and I'm like uh, my collection hasn't grown in value that much every year and so i've ha- I had to have them dial it back because i was, was getting where i was paying too much i mean folks i mean i'm going to assume that throughout the united states there are avid collectors but this collection has to rank on a a top 100 in the country scale it is huge it is enormous have you ever have you ever connected with any any other collectors to compare your size <laughs> well um there's a really prominent collector out of seattle um, who actually writes books on these things and is this gus lopez yeah it was gus lopez okay and uh oh man his stuff uh, he had his collection was amazing I and mean, he had a death star prop it was the death star used in a new hope wow he pulled that out of a trash out of a dumpster what? Yeah. yeah. So he, he out of would a go dumpster. To... The actual Death Star model he pulled out of a dumpster. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I hope he didn't pay for it. I hope he just ran. <laughs> he would he would go to Tunisia and pull stuff out of the desert and send, you know, crates of stuff back. I mean, okay. Was, well, we're not going to go into that level right, of right. insanity. But yeah. as far as the the above average collector, this collection has to rank somewhere on the the top scale. Yeah. It's. It's it's a pretty decent sized collection. I know people that probably have more new stuff, and there's there's some people that I know that have more vintage stuff. But I'd say the vintage side of it's pretty good, you know, as far as you know that's concerned. I don't want to blow it out of proportion. Not there's there's some really big and some really nice collections out there that would sure. definitely overtake mine, but. But, but folks, it's not just toys. I mean, his house has, it looks like, if I'm not mistaken, the whole Burger King collection of cups. He's got the collector plates. He's got pins. He's got everything under the sun, Star Wars. It looks like, to me, the majority of your house, from what I saw in the video that Jared shot, most of your house is a Star Wars memorabilia museum, yeah. basically. Yeah, it goes. it starts, you know, it goes down the stairwell, and then I've got about, I don't know, 1200 square feet of star Wars stuff in my basement. Wow. There's some dead space, you know, for couches and you know that, but outside of that, it's pretty much all on display as you, you know, you've seen in the videos and the pictures. Brian, I'm going to ask you a a very specific question that everybody is, is probably wondering. Does your wife like star Wars? Yes, she does. And uh, now she's not the fan that I am, (laughs) but, she does love watching the movies with me most of the time. Although she won't watch Revenge of the Sith because I took her to the theater and we watched it like eight times or something, <laughs> and she got tired of it. But outside of that one, she's she's really cool about watching them and uh, just hanging out, and she doesn't mind having it all around. Oh, and she didn't really care for the life size Watto that I picked up recently. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of those things where she just was like, "I don't like it." <laughs> <laughs> it's yes, ugly I and he, he was mean and it's like well it's cool looking because it's life size hmm. the life size Watto. Yes. yeah but i mean come on brian did you really need to be sleeping with it <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Get you know, out of the bed. I did. I did fall asleep on the couch down here with it. Oh no. <laughs> man. <laughs> the, it should be said that the upstairs of Brian's house is a a, a fairly normal suburban uh, residence. Yeah, it's more or less Star Wars free up there, except for a few small things, you know, lurking around here and there. Oh, and you know, the Star Wars obsession goes. It hit our wedding too. We used music from the Star Wars movies. We actually got some uh, members of the Five O First to come, and we had Vader there and some stormtroopers and things wandering around, mingling with guests. That's so fantastic. That was a lot of fun. So she was a good sport about that. So, so in your collection, there has to be some favorites of yours that you have. What are some of you, like your top favorites that you walk by and you're like, yes. Oh. Uh, Probably one of them is my yak face. Both of my yak faces. Um, you know, yak face was only sold some. In, there were a few in Canada, and they were sold over in the UK and in Europe. And uh, man, why didn't we get them? What makes yak face like so? I don't know. It was one of those weird things that they just didn't sell it here well, for some didn't crazy yak, reason. Yak face was part of the Power of the Force line, which was. Is that correct? Yeah, he, that, they, that, they sold him Tri Logo and uh, Power of the Force line. And so I think that was the last gasp for the Star Wars. Yeah, line. yeah. And, and I think I think I read that you know he wasn't brought here just because of, for lack of interest. Yeah, that's very yeah you know, that's very likely because I mean it was the last figure released of the of the original line, and. Um, you know, I didn't even know about Yak Face till I started collecting. Oh, I, mean, I, I had it, no idea. In the nineties, yeah, in the nineties, mm-hmm. when I started collecting is when I found out about it. And I really, you know, the Power of the Force line. I remember going to KB Toys and you know Toys R Us, and you'd see these, you know, big metal bins, and they'd be filled up with Star Wars figures that were all Power of the Force, and they all had the little coin and everything. Well, the jokes on us the people that didn't buy them because those are some of the most valuable figures in the entire line yeah. outside they, of the original 12. And in those, in those uh, discount bins, they were like a buck. Yeah. Or, or something. Yeah. yeah. A three or $4 figure was like a dollar. I, I would, oh my God. I would walk by those on my way to the GI Joe section. <laughs> yes, I did that too. I only bought one of those and it was a Han Carbonite and um, I lost the block I still had the Han. Okay. So, what about the coin? I lost the coin too. And you call yourself a collector. Let's. I think this is over. This conversation is <laughs> over. <laughs> we see here. There's a. There's a lot of, of new stuff. And I'd like your opinion because, as a collector, what what is really what what has engaged you, from the new stuff. I mean. Obviously, the vintage, the vintage stuff from the seventies and eighties, that's that's always gonna, you know, th- that holds a special place in our hearts. Obviously, but for you as a collector, what has impressed you from the stuff post ninety five to twenty twenty? Um, of the last probably ten years or so, Hasbro has put out a vintage collection. And these figures are generally articulated more. Um, and then they have the vintage style packaging, which just appeals to my senses. Cause I always felt like star Wars should have always been packaged that way. I felt like they should never have changed it, that everything should have been done that way. And that may seem a little weird and not with the times, but you know, it, it's so iconic and it, and it looks so clean compared to some of this packaging and stuff mm-hmm. that I really love it. And um, one of the coolest things that they've come out with, you know, and it was, this was, uh, it came, it arrived last year, but it was a crowd crowdfunding uh, exercise by Hasbro through their HasLab arm was the uh, Java sail barge. I mean, that thing, you know, is three or four feet long, you know, houses a hundred and, 25 30 figures it's super detailed it's just absolutely amazing and 
I have one of those on display. I think I sent you guys pictures of it. That you yeah, you post took it a, if you want. You took a, a video of it. Yeah, I did a little video of that because I mean, there's just so much there, and you know, I I use the mix of vintage and non-vintage figures to fill it out, and that's one thing they've done a good job of. But the newer stuff is adding figures that we didn't have, because the original vintage line only had 97 figures if you count the uh, the blue snaggletooth. You know, so, and then there's some variations and things in there, but, you know, 97 figures was, was it. So, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. There's a lot of, you know, figures they could fill out with. I remember when they released Tarkin in the nineties, that was a big deal. That was a because, huge deal. Because it was like, ah, finally we're getting a Tarkin. And what a, what a strange thing not to include in the original line. He was such a big character, too. Did you know, uh, as an attempt to revitalize the line right before it died, they were going to, the last, that they'd actually made some uh, mock ups, but they were going to bring in Grand Moff Tarkin, and they had this storyline where he had survived the Death Star. And it was going to be Tarkin and some new vehicles and stuff. It, it didn't get past prototype because at that, this was like, I guess it was right around Power of the Force, and I guess, so it never got to production, but we almost did get a Tarkin out of that original line, but they killed they killed the line altogether. I thought yeah. that was an interesting idea. They tried to incorporate a new uh, story to continue, because I guess that was one of the reasons that the, the figure line died was, you know, you had three movies and that was it. Yeah, you know? and, and Lucas wasn't going to just jump into another... Um, you know, he, he wasn't, he wasn't making any more for a while. And th that's kind of, I could understand how that would be rough on Kenner's business model. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, they came out with those droids and Ewoks cartoons as a way to try to resuscitate some of the toy sales and things, but, but they didn't really match the, the no. previous figure. They, they, I know that when they released Boba Fett, that was the only one they took like the original Boba Fett figure and jammed it in, in a, <laughs> In yeah, a package they, they did the same droids. thing with the A-wing pilot too. <laughs> oh yeah, it that's was, right. It was thrown in there, and not even C three PO and R two D two look the same. Those were like new molds for the right. And, you know, that's a whole interesting you know end of collecting vintage stuff too. I mean, that's those are kind of hard to find, and you know, they're kind of course. getting expensive. I mean, isn't there one that was only released in Brazil? Like yeah, like Vlix. The, yeah, those are th those yeah, are you're like you're gonna pay a mint to get one of those things. <laughs> unreachable. Yeah. yeah, that's that's not even my. How many of those do you have? Zero. <laughs> I didn't see him in the barge. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, um, there was there wasn't a slot that expensive. <laughs> you get one of those things on card if you can find one and be you know twenty grand probably or something uh, stupid. I don't mean to to go off go branch off, but just out of curiosity, is there a problem with uh, like people selling fakes? Yes, I, I mean. That's part of collecting and, you know, identifying uh, weapons are the worst. People trying to sell fake weapons. And I bet you that'd be pretty easy to slip through, wouldn't it? it? It is if you're, you know, your eyes not trained for it. And, you know, one of the things, uh, most of the, you know, there's like a float test, you know, to see if weapons will float or not. And then there's, wow. there's you can look at them sometimes. The colors, like. Somebody try to pass off a Leia blaster that's gray. Well, those don't exist. I mean, come you know, on, you know, <laughs> gray blasters. Everyone knows that. Well, you know, with three D printing now, I wonder if if that's where people are starting to to experiment in some of these, you know, uh, counterfeits where they can just three D print the exact specs. I'm but, sure that they are. <laughs> but uh, man, yeah, that would open up a whole new, yeah, a whole new deal. But you still have, you know, density issues with the plastic and just how they look. It's really, you know, the coloring of them and, and those sorts of things. I mean, you just, and there's websites out there. There's the Imperial Gunnery that is dedicated to ferreting out fakes by having a database of all these pictures of weapons and what they should look like. And then fakes next to them show what they shouldn't look like. And do that pictures of bodies of people who tried to sell some fakes. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I got a couple buried out in my backyard. <laughs> Shh. 
So I see uh, in, in this vast collection, you have a lot of, of boxed figures, it looks like. Have these yes. been sent off and, and certified? Of the wall, um, probably about half of them. I think I have, I have over 200 mint on card figures. And the wall has, there's over 130 on the wall. And probably about 65 or 70 of those have been graded. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of them, I just put them in acrylic so it would look nice. So you can buy these acrylic cases and, you know, they just have a little sliding bottom and you put the thing in there and there it is. But it, it makes for a really nice display. And the wall is one of these things that John and I aspired to when we were starting to collect, you know, and the wall is considered to be one of each figure on card. So from the from the vintage from the vintage right. line, and there are multiples of some figures on mine. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Darth Vader picture, where you have you know Vader on a Star Wars card, and an Empire card, and a Jedi card, and then another pose on a Jedi card, and then a Tri Logo card that's from the UK or or from Europe, and then a Power of the Force card, and one with the coin. So you know, I've actually got a full run of Vader figures, and I kind of made it a point to get those because I just always liked that figure and, yeah, yeah they never changed that mold did they no they didn't they just left it the only I'm difference there, you know there's is... a there's a darth vader floating around in the atlantic ocean <laughs> there's probably more than one <laughs> from, from from mike was that i remember you told that story on a podcast last year that was your uh your Vader just got swept out to sea by your dumb friend. <laughs> yeah, he had like three seconds in his hand, and then he let it go. Fast. Oh, oh man. I'm, I'm watching his sail barge video right now. Was that a, a Raider's Golden Idol I saw yes, in there? Yes, that is. That is. <laughs> I found that somewhere, and I just threw it in there. I thought, oh, this will be fun. And the and the crate that's in there, and you know, a couple of oddball things, a couple of little Easter eggs to to see when you're you're watching that video. So. What is your would you be your favorite piece that is non like Kenner figure related in your collection? You There's can probably be, more than be, one. It could be an autograph or a poster or yeah. There's actually a few things. I really like my Lego Death Star. I think that's a really cool toy. Oh, it's outrageous. That detail is sick. Yeah, and then. And, the, and then the Star Destroyer, too. Both of those are just outstanding. And I've got the Falcon, but I haven't put it together yet. It's just sitting there in a box for the last two years. But um, there's a couple of things. I've got a, a Jedi poster that has a lot of autographs on it. Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Billy D. Williams, Warwick Davis, Peter Mayhew, Kenny Baker. You know, all these guys, you know, that play these iconic characters. And Did you, know, you get it from them personally? Yes, um, all those guys I met to get that poster signed, um, which is really cool. And um, and then a couple of years ago, I picked up some one sheets, uh, theatrical one sheets for re-releases of Jedi Empire and A New Hope. And The New Hope has actually a little banner across the bottom of it that says Revenge of the Jedi on it. Because it was a promo for before Jedi came out, so that was kind of neat. But they're all re-release posters that were, uh, you know, early re-release posters uh, from the early '80s, and they they all have the proper markings and stuff. I mean, they're they're legitimate theatrical one sheets uh, that I picked up from this lady. And then I have a uh, just a regular Empire poster signed by Irving Kirshner which that's one of my favorites. Yeah. Brian got me an Irving Kirshner autograph too. That's it's right. A, yeah. yeah. And it, it was personalized to me, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, director of my favorite star Wars movie. That was, uh, and the fact that he's no longer with us is, uh, pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I really like that, you know, that just, the fact that he got to meet the director of probably the greatest Star Wars movie is, is just, that was so cool. So Brian, which toy, which toys do you think were 
from the original movies your favorite? Do you think it was it the was it A New Hope? Was it Empire? Or was it Jedi that you liked the best? Of the toys? Oh man, when I was a kid, that ad at was just that was the toy. I, I mean, that was the it. ultimate Star it. Wars toy. I mean, even though I had a Death Star, which was really cool, I kept crashing my X Wing into it and it kept breaking <laughs> and falling apart and all this stuff. But man, that ad at I got so much play and I do have my original ad at complete wow. from when I was a kid. I bought one. Gosh, I think I bought it when I was 30. I think Jared, I think you have my ad at now, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, you gave that to me and it sat in Hannah's room for many years. Good. <laughs> yeah. The empire toys. Got we- lipstick and makeup on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those empire toys are great. Oh man. I love those things. And the, you know, like the turret and probot play sets. You know, it came with the yes. probe droid, the turret, and you could knock the probe droid off and the Imperial attack base with all the collapsing things and the Falcon. Oh, the original Falcon. That was such a great piece. Yeah, I had that. That was I got that on Christmas. I remember waking yep. up and that thing sitting there. Yeah, me too. Christmas morning. That they was... used the mold for that till they broke it. They literally broke the mold. <laughs> when they were doing the, you know, the more modern run and they had to redo the Falcon completely. And they did one that was, which is a fantastic toy, the, the legacy Falcon. And it's huge. Yeah. It's the big one, right? Oh man. It is. It's awesome. Is that to scale with the figures like actual? Yeah. It's a little more to scale. You can actually has four cockpit places instead of two. And there's all kinds of little chambers and stuff inside of it. Did and you ever you, wonder what was behind that cardboard wall in the yeah. back? Did, did you always like, <laughs> want to get plastic, in there? Man. What's in there? <laughs> I didn't ever dig mine out, but yeah. I, I think that's where um, Han and Leia were doing it. <laughs> doing what? <laughs> uh, Making sparks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, the... Uh, Sure, Leo. <laughs> sure, Leo. <laughs> and didn't you help um, our friend Charlie, who we've also heard on the podcast? He he reached out to you uh, to help complete uh, one of his Falcons that he had, one of those big. Yeah, Falcons. actually, I uh, I got him the shell. The, okay, the shell for it. Yeah, nice. And um, it was missing the escape pod and some pieces and stuff, but I think he was going to three D print some of that and. Okay. Like some landing gear. I found on some landing mm-hmm. gear too at one point. But uh yeah, yeah. That, that Falcon is really uh is really a cool toy. And yeah. It's got, got the a... the ramp that comes down automatically uh, with the lights and the sounds and I love that's my favorite feature on that thing. <laughs> one of my favorite things was um I I was over at your house when Hannah was very young. I have a video of this somewhere and she's and and she is like looking at that Falcon and I think me and you both were like really had strong pucker factor as she was yeah. like poking around in it. Like, and cause she was only like one and a half or something. And she was all, you know, hands and feet and yeah. And touching. And, but uh, yeah, that was, that was really neat. So Brian, at this stage of the collection, how active are you in looking for new stuff? Um, I mean, are you content? Or are you always, always out for something? Oh, does it become like you're more you're more focused on finding something particular, or is it always just a wide net that you're just hoping to cast out and bring stuff in? Are you like the Eye of Sauron, always searching? <laughs> well, you know, the search thing is weird. I'm, I'm on and off with it. It's like I'm always on. It's always in the back of my mind, but um, sometimes I'm more active than others. And you know, right now I'm kind of in a down phase. With, you know, all the social distancing and things that are going on. I, I'm just, there's not many garage sales to go hit or anything like that. And I don't like buying off of eBay a whole lot. And then there's this other factor of, as far as vintage stuff is concerned, I've gotten to the point where there's not a whole lot that I feel like I need. There's a few things here and there. And I don't want to go down this rabbit trail of, oh, well, I want to get that. Oh, it's seven, eight hundred bucks, and then oh wait, I like this too. It's a thousand dollar, you know. It could just add up really fast, and it's just I'm just trying to stay out of that right now. (laughs) 
trying to check myself a little bit, but as far as the spending is concerned, and also like to have a little bit of money stashed for uh, collections, because what will happen is, this, this has happened a few times to me, where somebody will contact me out of the blue, like my dad, he had a guy that he knew that lived in a town near here, and he he has a Star Wars collection, and he's wanting to sell it. And I, you know, here's his number. Give him a call, and I go and I, you know, spend a thousand dollars, you know, buying Star Wars toys off this guy. And uh, then you know, when that happens, I have some rules about buying collections. I have to be able to fund it with what I buy. So, um. Basically, what that means is I'll have to I'll, I'll keep some of it, but whatever I keep, I've got to be able to pay for it, you know, by selling some of the other stuff. And usually, I don't sell stuff that I don't have already. I'll keep all the stuff I don't have, but then I'll take everything else. But I bought a truckload. It was a truckload I bought from this guy. And uh, there's a lady in uh, Cookville that I've bought you know, stuff from a couple of times. I've probably bought over 70 carded figures from her vintage and kept a bunch of them and sold a bunch of them. Make my Have money you ever back. been out somewhere and unexpectedly found something that was like, you were like, Oh my gosh, I've got two stories that would fit that bill really well. There was this, uh, I went to bag a bargain, which was something put on by, some girls club here in town, but they, it's like a rummage sale type thing. And they had one of these legacy Falcons there and I bought it. I saw it and it was five bucks and I bought it, which is super cheap. Yeah. The five big bucks. Falcon. Yeah. I was uh, like, Oh man, I was, it, was it this complete? Thing. It was mostly complete. I mean, it had almost everything. It was, <laughs> it was actually really nice shape. I'm like, who gave this up? Well, I got home and my friend Jennifer, who had gone to that event with me, we were sitting there and I was, oh yeah, let's check out this Falcon. And so I'm pulling it apart, checking what pieces are here missing or, or it there. Had gold bars in it. Close. It had, <laughs> it had a blue snaggle, a vintage blue snaggle tooth in it. Oh wow. Way. Yeah. It was in the car, like in a hidden compartment. Did it have like a there. BB mark in its forehead? <laughs> no. This one was actually pretty nice. Where was oh, it? Wow. Where was it at? It was like a hidden compartment in the Falcon. Wow. You, knew, you lost your mind right there, didn't you? I did. What, what is that thing? I absolutely lost it. <laughs> what does a blue snaggle tooth sell for? You know, two to three hundred bucks. Holy cow. You paid five dollars for that Falcon. <laughs> yeah, I sold the Falcon for like fifty later. You know, <laughs> before they started going really high. And uh I remember so I, seeing those on in Walmart on clearance because I don't think they sold that well when they first came well, out. Well they were hundred and fifty dollars out of yeah. the gate. I mean I bought mine at Toys R Us, and I ended up with, uh, I got a pretty good deal on mine because they gave me all these discounts and stuff because I was really nice to the cashier, and nobody had been nice to her that night. On a, It was like when they released a bunch of Clone Wars stuff, and that Falcon came out that night, too. It was a midnight thing, and I think some people were rude to her, and I was super nice, and she just gave me every discount possible. I think it, possible. I think I got that for like 30% off or something. It was Wow. Yeah, on opening night. So Hear that folks being nice pays. <laughs> yeah. And then um the other one was I was at a garage sale and I'll I'll frequently ask if they have any old Star Wars toys. And, you know, you get a lot of Yeah, I've got some, but I'm not selling them. Yeah, are, are you displaying them? No, I'm not doing that. I'll just have them in a box somewhere. And I'm like, come on. This one guy, I asked him, after asking his wife, who his wife was like, no, we don't have any of that. And the guy had walked out and I said, do you have any old Star Wars toys? And he goes, yeah, I think I've got a couple up at the top of my closet. So he goes and he's gone for like five minutes. <laughs> just and have he, him laying around. <laughs> and he comes back. And this is just like five minutes from my house. He comes back with this baggie and I see a figure in it or something. And it has like the, the card backs in it. Well turns out all these figures were attached to the card so they were all mint on card figures as they were sold originally and one of them was a 12 back chewbacca explain pretty... explain the 12 back thing okay so when <clears throat> figures when the star wars figures were first released at the stores there were 12 of them and so a 12 back had the 12 figures listed on the back of the card 
And then, you know, it goes on. There were, then there was a 20 back and a 21 back and a 32 back. And it goes on and on and on and on. Still, they, you know, got to the end. Well, this guy, this guy had a, let's see, I think it was a Power of the Force B-Wing pilot, which isn't that great, and a uh, Return of the Jedi Leia battle poncho, and they had this 12-back Chewie. So I offered the guy 50 bucks. He said, deal. I took him and got out of there as fast as I could. Because... That Chewie, he has four or $500. Wow, that's and then, amazing. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I got it graded, and it graded out pretty decent. So, you know, it's probably a $1,000 figure. Wow. Picking through the uh, diamonds in the rough there. Yeah, no kidding. I just found, I just found uh, my Chewbacca from when I was a kid. He was in a box. I had moved recently, and he was stuffed in a bottle box, just sitting there with his arms like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's Chewy. That was my Chewy I had when I was a kid. Real quick, but you mentioned how you turn over some of your collection to fund expanding the collection. Yeah. Was there anything you gave up where you're like, ah, you sold it and you regret it, or you're like, it was tough to give up, but you did it? You know, back in the broke college days, there were a few times where I overextended myself and had to sell a few pieces that I didn't want to sell. But um, not in recent memory. Most of my regrets are not being able to um, execute the purchase of collections. There's one in particular that happened back in 1999. Um, I was about to get married to my first wife. And the breakup had nothing to do with Star Wars. But um, (laughs) although I should have... I should have, instead of saving money for the honeymoon, I should have probably bought the Star Wars collection because it would have been <laughs> worth a lot more money now than it was then. I had I had four or five thousand dollars, and uh, this guy offered to sell me his uh, collection for about three grand, and he had probably I don't know seventy or eighty carded figures, but he also had I think three. Star Wars carded Boba Fett's, which each go for probably two to five thousand dollars a piece, depending on the condition and things. Uh, and he had a bunch of 12 backs, you know, he had boxed ships that I never even got to really look at. I mean, I went and looked at his collection, but I didn't dig through everything. I mean, he had a living room full of stuff just boxed up, and yeah, he wanted three grand for this whole collection. I couldn't pull the trigger because I knew I had to have the money for something else. And I could have probably done it without probably could have gone on the trip without that money, but I couldn't risk it. And, um, man, that, that hurts. That hurt. And it still bothers me to this day. So it's the that one that got away. It. <laughs> it is the one that got away and it was a big one. I still don't have a, a Boba Fett on a star Wars card. Cause I won't mm. spend that much money on one figure. So, well, yeah. as a special treat for joining us today, we got you one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> a picture of one, right? Yeah, yeah. I I printed it out, and uh... <laughs> I do have the card back though for one. Well, Somewhere so, along the way, I got a card back for well, one. Well, maybe you can reconstruct it someday, and uh, <laughs> just just have a facsimile on your shelf until the real one comes along. Or maybe you'll buy like an ad at and. You'll find Open it up, and there's one inside of it. <laughs> it'd be all wadded up in there. That would be amazing. Priest, and but it'd be on card, and it would be there. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's the one that got away, and that was that was super painful. You know, the more I think about it, I try not to think about it really, but yeah, you know, I'm very <laughs> thankful for the collection that I have and that I've been able to accumulate over the years, and you know, still adding, and you know, I do have like the Wado was a recent you know, addition. I also got some posters that were really cool. Like one is a, it's some sort of foil or mylar based poster from uh, like for the soundtrack that they sent to record stores and stuff to, you know, promo to, to promote it. Yeah. To promote the soundtrack. And also got a, the life size R2D2 Pepsi cooler from this guy. That's a really and a an elusive concepts job of the hut, which is you know pretty good Does size. Does the cooler work? The cooler is just a uh, you just put ice in it. Oh, you know. okay. 
Yeah, it's, I, d- I do remember those at gas stations during yeah. the, the Phantom Menace. Well, it's pretty era. cool, though. Take it yeah. to a picnic. Yeah, <laughs> we host a Christmas party every year, and we thought about taking it upstairs and filling it with filling ice. It full and, of ice. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> well, you know, you, you don't want to you don't want to risk damaging it, of course. No. I know you got to be real careful. That dome is super fragile. I've already cracked it. Oh, oh, Brian. Well, it's on the inner lip of it, so it's not like you can see it or anything. You it's ruined just, it. Yeah, it totally ruined it. Actually, I think it's in pretty good shape overall. It may have already been cracked. I just felt it when I picked it up. <laughs> okay, now I got a quick question. In your opinion, what is the dumbest Star Wars figure? Oh, the dumbest <laughs> Star Wars figure. Question. I was I was thinking the same thing. Like, like what is the one that's like, oh my gosh, why did they release this? It's ridiculous. No one oh, cares about man. this guy. As a kid. Now, as know, an adult, because as an adult, your perspective is different from a kid. Kid, right. you think like, you know, characters are like, you know, Princess Leia, who cares about Princess Leia? Well, no, as a kid, I thought like the Rancor Keeper was kind of dumb. You know? Wow, really? <laughs> who wants this big fat guy, you know? Yeah, it's true, though. I mean, he's in it for three seconds. So I do, how are right. you going to play with them? Like, you, well, we're on... Uh, Endor, how did that guys with us? <laughs> how did they figure that guy, but not Tarkin? Exactly, that's no exactly kidding. what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, but as far as like modern stuff, I mean, there's not been any that just bother me off the top of my head. So you know, that just drive me nuts. Did now, Laura, did did Laura Dern purple hair get a figure? Uh, yeah, she got a black series figure. Black series. That's even that's even more insulting. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they got the shade of purple right on her hair. Otherwise, it's unacceptable. Constable Zuvio. That's oh, one. Constable that's a Zuvio. waste of Constable waste of space. Zuvio. Who is that's that? Like, exactly. He, he, he never was, was in the movie. He was the first <laughs> figure released. He was like, wasn't he released like an early bird type of deal for The Force Awakens? Yeah, maybe. I don't and, remember. And... And then he he swung from the pegs, as they say, for for years. Afterwards. What did he look like? Did yeah. he have like which? A, what was that character? Who did he have that? a dome helmet on? Or he, something? he had like yeah. a, a, a wide brim sombrero yeah. looking. He hat. wasn't even in the movie. No, he, exactly. he wasn't in the movie. <laughs> that's probably the dumbest figure ever made, right there. I think one of the things that's cool, like if if I was to ever try to collect, I think I would try to just do the vintage because there's a finite number of them. I think. Yes. The f- the fact that it's just ever growing it has to be like frustrating because you it's like I will never ever have all of these. It's yeah. like it, it's impossible. Like how many different clone troopers are there? Right. There's a bazillion. Now it's funny though you say that about a finite number of vintage figures because while there is a finite number, it feels sometimes like there's not. And what I mean by that is. There are collectors out there that will, they go to these extraordinary lengths to find every different version of a Luke Skywalker. So you've got your base, like a farm boy Luke Skywalker. You've got a double telescoping lightsaber. You've got a telescoping lightsaber. You've got blonde hair, brown hair, orange hair. Well, then you've got made in Hong Kong, made in Taiwan, made in, you know, wherever. I'm talking about you know, a sane collector. Right. Well, yeah, sane collector, yes. But <laughs> there are people that have gone out there and they're starting to, you know, hunt down all these just little small variants. And it's it's actually kind of frustrating, you know, when you, you think about it. Because, yeah, I think, okay, the brown hair and the blonde hair Luke thing, I get that. I've got both. I don't have an orange hair Luke. Somebody offered me one. I said, no thanks. I'm not spending that kind of money. On I don't need like a ginger that. Luke. No thanks. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, and I got my double telescoping Luke, which, you know, I would love to have a double telescoping Kenobi or, or Vader, but they're, you know, eight or nine grand if you, you know, you can find one. Wow. And before we wrap it up, I just want to give a little history lesson on Brian's uh, Star Wars uh, museum. The the his house, Brian actually purchased from his father the house he grew up in, which is where the museum is located. (laughs) And you know, 
as a kid, when I would go to Brian's house, it was the, the cool, fun house. Because in the basement now, where the museum resides, there was a, a pool table and an air hockey table. His dad really like pimped it out like a like an arcade almost. And Brian was the first kid I knew who had a twenty six hundred. And he he's the guy we talked about last year on the podcast who could do the first two minutes of pitfall <laughs> with his eyes closed and, and not and not die. But <laughs> but so you know as and we played we would play Star Wars at his house for hours and hours like stay up all night playing Star Wars. So it's interesting when I go back to Tennessee to visit uh, family and friends and I visit Brian's house, it's the only house, the only residence from my childhood that I can still walk into. You know, it's because, you know, my parents have moved four or five times. You know, my grandparents have passed away. You know, you just don't, the, the house you grew up in, or houses that you were familiar with as a kid, as you grow up, you you know, you really don't see them anymore. But that I can go to Brian's house and it's still like this this magical, you know, Star Wars place, that's that to me is almost like, you know, that's returning to that's returning home, like as a kid. So I've always uh I've always enjoyed that aspect of it. That mm. that that I can look around his current museum and say, Hey, you remember when we used to, you know, set up Hoth base on top of the air hockey table and, and all that stuff. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun for me. Well, it must be because we've talked about how star Wars feels like your home when you watch, especially the original trilogy. So for Jared, Brian, I'd watch out. He might start putting his, uh, you know, his overnight bag in your house and just move in. <laughs> hey, I mean, shut that up, much man. star Wars, that shut much up. star Wars. And so I'm here, I'm moving in. Jared's welcome here anytime. Well, I'm sure Terry would enjoy that occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it is to walk into it. I mean, you see the little foyer there with the Imperial cog on the floor and the, mm-hmm. the Bespin lighting scheme. It's, uh, it's, 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 it, he does, he has, he sets the stage really nicely. And, uh, and then, you know, going in and just, just looking at, at all the, the stuff new and old that, uh, that he has on display it's really amazing to see yeah i mean these pictures and the videos i've seen are just absolutely amazing maybe from we we, i'm lucky someday i'll be able to to journey up to tennessee and see with my own eyes because this is uh, unbelievable to to see yeah down down to tennessee journey down yeah oh yeah Yeah. i'm in new york you're You're not in florida anymore yeah hey anytime (laughs) you know mike's been over here too he's gotten a little glimpse of it so yeah, but then you caught me and chased yeah. me out with your gun. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> Seeing collections like this is rare. Uh, I mean, I, this is not my world. And to see something like this really brings me back to when I was a kid. Because I remember, like we all used to, you know, I remember looking through like the service merchandise catalog. Oh, yeah. that used to have all the, the figures set up that you could look at because we didn't have the internet back then. So this is how we, we saw our toys, you know, through magazines and newspapers and catalogs. And I would dream about these toys. And I see them now in all these pictures. And it just takes me right back. And Brian, you know, on this podcast, we've discussed Star Wars a lot. We've talked about what movies and what parts of it we like and what it means to us. But why do you think Star Wars is what it is why is star wars such the phenomenon that it is that that you yourself have devoted quite a bit of your life to to celebrate it um for me there's i mean at this age you know being in my mid-40s and everything you know there's a huge nostalgia effect to it um and growing up on that as a kid and you know as a kid it was really cool to see this universe, this galaxy that was created. And it was just, it was just so amazing and so new and fresh, but yet it felt like it was historic, you know, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, it made you feel like there was history there and that it could have happened. And then, you know, as a kid, it did happen. 
And that's what really kind of got me sucked into it. It's almost like it did happen. And, you know, at that age, you know, being, you know, I was six when I saw Empire at the theater for the first time. And, you know, I saw A New Hope shortly after that, actually. Um, and I learned that Stormtroopers talk, but it was, <laughs> it was just kind of an interesting thing. But, um, you know, it, it just captivated my imagination, you know, at that age. And, um, and the toys, you know, I had toys before I ever saw a movie. And it, oh, it was it was just something special, you know. And it's a it's the story, you know. It's good versus evil. I mean, it gets a little more complicated than that when you get into it and dive deeper. But as a kid, it's good versus evil. Yeah, it's easy to digest. You know what's you know yes. the good guys from the bad guys. Exactly. There's no gray. No, it's it's just it, it was just absolutely amazing. Very well said, sir. So, anyway, we're going to be putting some pictures up on social media so you guys can have some... This this will be an interactive episode. It has pictures with it. Thanks for uh, thanks for talking to us today. And uh, yeah, Brian, we, thanks for sharing this amazing collection. This is outrageous. This is this is taking me back, uh, you know, to, to my childhood to stare at these. I'm going to look at these pictures tonight when we're off this this podcast. <laughs> but. Uh, no, but congratulations. This is an amazing, amazing amount of work, amazing collection. And it's just not a bunch of stuff thrown together. This, I mean, it looks like a museum. When, we do see, when you see the pictures, you'll, you'll understand the, uh, the level of care and love he's given this collection. It's, it's spectacular. So, and, and uh, please, uh, if, you, if, you score, if you score something amazing, let us know and we'll have you on the show to talk about it. Oh, yeah. I appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, you know, it's been great talking about collecting and we could talk about this for hours and you know, anytime you want me on, just let me know and we'll, we'll talk some more. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks guys. Kenner's star Wars, X-wing fighter, tie fighter and action figures all sold separately. Well, that was fantastic. Uh, I, I can't thank your friend Brian enough for coming on here and sharing that. That was really, really fantastic. It's fun to talk about. And, uh, and I, I tell you what, but what really surprised me about that was I was thinking, we had mentioned it kind of earlier, like that can be a rabbit hole that you go down, the collecting, the obsession of it. But he approached it and approaches it very smart. And I liked how he was, how he manages his collection through growing it through getting like, he pieces out some of it to get, to make it bigger here and there. Well, yeah. Has, the fact it, that it's, it kind of sustains itself. Yeah, that it's interesting to me. It's a fascinating world, but he's a, a really neat guy, and his collection is world class. And if it's not one of the biggest in the southeast, then uh, yeah, I, I, think he, be, I think he's got to rank in the country somewhere. I think you can say it's safely top ten in the southeast. But anyway, we are coming up on the end of season two, guys. It is close. Next week will be the season finale. And we'll be taking a little time off this summer. You know, you got to come back next week, and uh, we'll uh, we'll finish out season two with something that's probably going to blow your mind, or it may just mildly entertain you. It's one of those. Yeah, so come back next week, and uh, we're approaching the finish line here, so you don't want to miss it. You know you can't live without this content. So subscribe to the Hyperspace Podcasting in the 25th Century. Follow us on social media. Leave us a review. And join us next time as we take you into the 25th Century.